Thank you. So you don't really need to see my name because it's already been on the screen, but that's me. And um, I am here from Portland, Oregon, where I moved from the San Francisco Bay Area a little over a year ago. And in fact, the last time I gave a Creative Mornings talk was about five years ago in San Francisco in the early days of Creative Mornings. And I spoke about, you actually can watch it online, I spoke about this project that I did in 2010 called A Collection a Day. How many of you are familiar with that project that I did? Quite a, bit, quite a few of you. And um, that was actually one of the first public talks I ever gave, and the first public talk I ever gave that was recorded. And um, I still get nervous before I get on stage and talk to people, but I was never so nervous as that day, and somehow I managed to pull it off. So this morning, I'm going to talk mostly about my latest book, which is called The Joy of Swimming. And um, most of the illustrations you're going to see in this presentation are from this book. So I thought, for those of you who are here because you um, follow Creative Mornings, but not necessarily me or aren't familiar with my work, I thought I would do a really quick and dirty little thumbnail slideshow of some of the work I've created over the last few years, just so you can get an idea for the colors that I use and the look and feel of my work and the range of my work. There we go. So I did not start painting or drawing until 17 years ago when I was 31 years old. And at the time, I had a full-time career in the world of education. I worked as a project manager and eventually as an associate director in, um, in an education nonprofit in San Francisco, California. And we worked in high poverty public schools. And I loved what I did and I loved my colleagues and I felt um, really good about getting out of bed every morning. But there was something missing in my life. And so in addition to swimming, which I did a lot of at the time, I started taking art classes. I was trying to find the thing in my experience that felt like it was missing. And I got hooked. I got hooked on painting and drawing. And the, the interesting thing is, like anybody who starts painting or drawing for the first time, I wasn't very good at it. I had um, you know, the same stumbles and the same frustrations as anyone else. But I loved it so much that I kept doing it. And the more you do something, the better you get at it. So eventually, somewhere in there, um, a few years into it, I decided that I wanted to try to figure out a way to make a living doing this thing that, that I loved. And lucky for me, around that time, and this is in about 2005 or six, the internet was becoming a space for artists and makers to begin sharing their work and um, building connections with other artists and makers and people who supported them. And I um, got involved in, in this world, in particular, um, on this place called Flickr um, in around 2004. So even a couple years before I started to make a concerted effort to make this thing my living. And then, um, I started making connections with people, started getting inquiries about my work. And by that point, I had been drawing and painting for a few years. My work looked very different than it does now. Um, and I started to build a career. And over the last 10 years, since I essentially launched my career, I began working with clients all over the world. And here are some of them. So I'm just going to do that again while I talk. So I work with all of these clients. And the client that I work with for the longest and have done the most projects, in fact, the other day I counted and Chronicle Books, which is the last name that popped up there. Um, I've done around 15 projects with them, either as the illustrator. See, I did it again. Um, I'm just going to leave that there. The illustrator, the author, or a as a contributor. 
And um, so my relationship with Chronicle Books runs very long and very deep. They were one of my first clients in 2006. And they found me because I had this little art show at a little store in San Francisco called The Candy Store. And somebody from Chronicle Books came, saw my work, went back to the editor and said, you should see the work of this, this woman. And within two months, I had a meeting with the, the, one of the editors at Chronicle, and my relationship with them began. So one day in 2013, I was um, doing what I often did, meeting with my editor, Bridget Watson Payne. She is the person I've come to work with the most often at Chronicle. And we were meeting to discuss the success, or the very recent and early success, of a book that I had just published called Whatever You Are, Be a Good One. And the thing to understand about Whatever You Are, Be a Good One is that um, this is a book that I made that I sort of made on the fly, like it was part of this project I did in 2012 called um, uh, 365 Days of Hand Lettering. And um, we put it on the, we started working on a book even before that project was over. Um, I ended up, as part of that project, hand lettering quotations every day for a year. And we put the best of them into a book. And I did not think anyone would buy this book. I was very, you know, um, sort of blasé about putting it into the world. And yet, very quickly, this book sold very well. It sold out, the first run sold out within um, like a month of the book being released. And it's now sold well over 100,000 copies. And so when that happens in your world, more than likely you're gonna get a call from your editor saying, what, what do you wanna do next? And so one of the things that um, we decided at this lunch meeting this day that we were having, Chronicle Books, by the way, is in San Francisco, and at the time I lived there, we decided to make a sequel to Whatever You Are Be a Good One, which is called Fortune Favors the Brave. And this is a book of hand-lettered quotations that is um, focused solely on bravery. And so, um, that happened, this book um, was put on the fast track because they wanted to sort of ride the wave of success that Whatever You Are Be A Good One was having. Um, this book ended up coming out a little, about a year later. And then at that same lunch meeting, Bridget turned to me and she asked me, if you could make a book about whatever you wanted, what would it be about? So I want all of you to think about that for a second. If somebody asked you that question, what's the first thing that would come to your mind? And if you're anything like me, the answer is, I have no idea, <laughs> right? And that's not because we, we don't have passions and interests and things that we might want to write or make or illustrate a book about. That's just because that's a big question. And so I think I gave Bridget a very long stare, like, oh gosh, I don't know. And then we just got into the, the process of brainstorming possibilities while we're sitting there eating tacos together. And um, I said, well, you know, what about this? And what about this? And she said, well, you know, there's already a book about that. And I said, what about this? And she said, no, that's a little obscure. I'm not sure anybody would want th to buy that, you know. Um, and then she said, what about swimming? And we talked about it for a few minutes. And it's something that I have a long history with and a passion for. And Bridget, I've been a lifelong competitive swimmer. Um, Bridget is a very passionate um, recreational swimmer, lap swimmer, something that we're both really interested in. And so we said, yes, let's, let's make a book about swimming. So my swimming story started in the 1970s in suburban California where I had just moved from upstate New York. That's me around that time. It was a beautiful California day during the summer of 1977, and Queen's We Are the Champions was blasting from someone's boom box. Who remembers that song? Yeah. The Shadowbrook Splashers, my childhood swim team, had just won the championship meet. We danced and screamed in victorious revelry, all of us barefoot, nine-year-olds and teenagers alike. 
Our tan bodies clad only in faded team suits. Our mouths red from eating cherry-flavored jello blocks. These were the glory days of my childhood. The summers, the morning practices, the swim meets on Saturdays, the smell of chlorine in everything, especially my hair, straw dry and green from pool water. I lived for summers, and I spent nearly every available minute of them at the swimming pool down the block from my family's home in a suburban subdivision of San Jose, California's Almaden Valley. The pool was not only where I swam, but where, over luxuriously long summer days, I played in the grass, made friends, ate lunch, read books, and where I learned about disco music and flirting and card games. It was where I first became independent and where I first became aware of my physical strength. And it was always where my mother could find me at the end of the day if I wasn't in home in time for dinner. Nearly 40 years later, my favorite place to be in the summer or any time of the year if it is over 70 degrees Fahrenheit is still an outdoor swimming pool. The smell of chlorine, the feeling of rough poolside concrete under my bare feet, and the sound of water splashing are all so nostalgic for me that even now I am often transported back to the magic of my childhood simply by, by closing my eyes. I have been a swimmer since I was a small kid. In April of 1976, when I was eight years old, my family moved from upstate New York to sunny San Jose, California, now known as Silicon Valley. I'd taken swimming lessons already and expressed an interest early that summer in California to join the neighborhood swim team. My mother took me straight down to the pool and registered me for my first official team sport. I took to swimming like I took to eating, with a sort of relaxed devotion, as if it was my birthright to be in a swimsuit in 80 degree air next to a pool at all times. I was, in fact, so relaxed about competitive swimming that I never had the intense discipline to become a really fast swimmer as a kid. But being on the team did mean that I got to be in the water and hang out near the pool every single day, which was exactly where I wanted to be. And then, Fast forward, high school, swam in high school. I didn't swim competitively in um, college because um, I realized that, that collegiate swimming is like a whole different level of, of crazy um, and that I didn't have um, what that required. But I did, in my 20s, become a master swimmer. And master swimming was really like a, an amazing, amazing family for me, an amazing experience. Um, to really work hard at something. I feel like in some ways it prepared me for my art career, which started later, because I really learned about hard work and discipline and, and patience with myself. So one of the questions that I'm asked most often is, what is it like to make a book? And really the answer to that question depends on the kind of book you're making. I have um, now made books that are just illustrations, and I've now made a book that's got both writing and illustrations, and that's the one that I'm going to talk about today. And I'm working on another book now that comes out next year that is another collection of writing and illustrations. So I've started to develop a process for that. And the process is not, it's sort of like an arc. In some ways, it's like a spiral or a set of concentric circles. It's not super linear. And in some ways, it goes like this. It's fun at first, and then it's overwhelming, and then it's fun again, and then it's tedious, and then it's more tedious, and then I want to stab my eyes out, and then it's finished. <laughs> so the first phase for me is always the brainstorm. And do not let this black cloud and um, raindrops, like we saw this morning, fool you. The brainstorm phase to me is like where all the rainbows and butterflies are. And that's because um, this is the phase where you get to dream about what the book can become. And um, in this, this is my f absolute favorite phase of the bookmaking progress, pro process. This is where I write down um, everything I imagine the book being. And it's sort of like the beginning of a relationship when you're in that honeymoon phase and all, you know, everything is rainbows and butterflies and you're, you're already picturing yourself walking down the aisle with this person and all, you know, what the rest of your relationship is going to look like and it's all going to be so beautiful and wonderful. And that's sort of what the brainstorm phase is, like 
here are all the things that this book can be, all the beautiful illustrations I'm going to make, all the famous people I'm going to interview for the book, and um, all of the press it's going to get. And it's going to be on the New York Times bestseller list, and it's going to be amazing. And I really treasure the brainstorm phase because the reality is, and we'll talk more about this, that things really shift once you get started. So the next phase for me after the brainstorm is organizing. I've got all these ideas initially, and then I plop them into a spreadsheet. Now, don't worry that you can't read this. Um, this is a, a, a pasted together three screenshots from my MacBook Air um, of this, the spreadsheet that I made. It's really just a, like a giant list. Um, for the joy of swimming. And um, I, so artists have a reputation for being really disorganized. How many of you consider yourself a disorganized artist? I, I, okay, fair enough. I mean, um, I am lucky in that um, the right side of the, my brain and the left side of my brain work pretty equally together. How many of you can relate to that? Okay, so you're lucky because, um, because it does actually require a lot of organization to, to produce anything as an artist. And so um, I, like, I geek out just as much over a spreadsheet as I do over making art. Um, so maybe that's why making books is a really good um, profession for me. So anyway, in the, originally I took all the stuff in the, in the brainstorm and I kind of divided it into categories. And this, what I'm about to show you is like, are the names that I gave the categories um, for the book um, not, what I, not what I ended up calling them in the end, but originally I said I knew I wanted to profile living swimmers and in the book. I wanted to tell some swimming stories. I also wanted to profile some dead people. We'll call them non-living. Um, some peeps, some pioneers in swimming. I wanted to cover history and other informative stuff. Like I, I, this category ended up blowing up and there's many sub, sub, became many subcategories. Um, I knew I wanted to hand letter some quotes. Who knows what an aphorism is, right? My editor's like, can we have some aphorisms in the book? And I was like, um, sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> what's an aphorism? And she's like, oh, you know, like popular sayings and, and things. And so, yes, there are some aphorisms in the book, like dive in and um, plain artwork, was, which, which was my category for... Um, the stuff I knew to, that I wanted to draw and paint and include in the book, but didn't necessarily fit on, into any other category. It wasn't an infographic. It wasn't anything but just something in my mind's eye that I wanted to make sure I included. And I also wanted to include photographs in the book. Um, and um, so I ended up doing that. And it was something that my publisher resisted originally. They wanted the book to just have, be illustrated, and I really pushed for it, and I'm glad I did. So, um, So that was sort of how I started, and um, it, this was a way also for me to keep track of where I was. The book was 144 pages, so when you work with a publisher, they'll tell you this is how many pages your book can be. And so I had to make sure that the book was balanced and that I was covering all of the, you know, the categories and that I was making good progress, so by the time the book was ready to be turned in, I had 144 pages to turn in. So this was kind of how I kept track of of, um, of my page count as I was working and making sure that I had enough, enough content for the book. Reality. Um, so the reality is that even after I put all this, dumped all this stuff in a chart, six months later, seven months later, I turned the book in. And what that book looked like in the end or what that chart looked like in the end was very different than what it looked like when I first started in the rainbows and butterflies phase. And that's because lots of things happen. Some of them are logistical, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. And some of them are just creative problems that you can't solve well and that you need to make changes to your ideas because you realize something that you thought was going to work isn't actually going to work for one reason or another. So having a certain level of flexibility um, in your attitude about your creative process is, I think, really important, especially for big projects like this. So the next phase for me was research and outreach. I had to look at that list and say, all right, of these topics, um, which am I going to pursue? And 
where am I going to find the information that I need to develop the infographics for the book and to write about, um, for example, these you know, pioneering swimmers from the past. And so I did find a lot of books, but we also have the internet now, so we use that as well. And then I also began a process of reaching out to the swimmers that I wanted to include in the book. Reality. My original idea was that I was going to have all the famous swimmers in my book. I was going to have the Michael Phelps and the Jenny Thompsons of the world. And they were going to be so excited to be interviewed by me. But what ended up happening immediately is that I, um, I started the process of trying to find contact information, which was the first stumbling block. How, you know, even if the swimmer has a website, you've got the website, sometimes you're contacting their agent or their PR person. Um, and I hit so many stumbling blocks. And then I would email some of them, and then they wouldn't email me back. And I was really struggling. I did end up getting Lynn Cox, who's this amazingly well-known, accomplished distance swimmer to write the foreword for the book. She wrote this book, Swimming to Antarctica, which I highly recommend. Um, but I was really struggling with some of the younger swimmers or some of the retired swimmers. And I realized that I needed to change the focus of the book. So this is Kristen. She is my um, now almost full-time assistant. And she's a studio manager, but she also does a lot of writing, editing, research, and wrangling for me. In fact, she, we're working on another book now. She just texted me yesterday that a woman we have been tracking down to be in my next book we, she finally got a hold of her, and the woman agreed to be interviewed. So this is my new reality. But my reality two years ago when I was writing Joy of Swimming was it was just me. And I didn't have the time or energy to go after all of these people to be part of the book. And I was also working on multiple other projects at the time, and I was really buried. And so I said, what if I do a call for on my blog, and fortunately I have a pretty wide reach on my blog, and I say, tell me who I should interview for the book. I'm looking for regular people. So I abandoned the idea of interviewing famous swimmers, and I said, tell me who I should interview. Tell me who are people in, that you know or people in your life who have incredible swimming stories, people who've overcome hardship through, through swimming, people who swim every day or have swum every day for the last 50 years. Who are these people? I want to tell their stories. And the experience was the opposite of trying to wrangle the famous swimmers to be in my book. Um, my inbox was flooded with submissions and of names and people that had incredible swimming stories. And that really shifted the change of the uh, uh, shifted the focus of the book for me, and I think for the better. I, I feel like it's serendipitous that this happened, because most of the profiles in the book are of people who are not household names, but really have some amazing stories to tell about swimming and how it's impacted their life. Um, we went on also to, or so I ended up hiring this young woman named Malia to help me with a little bit of research at that point. Um, and we ended up collecting a lot of information that led to the infographics in the book. So facts about distance swimming, great moments in Olympic swimming, and all the while I'm thinking about how I'm going to present this information visually. I did um, a couple of spreads on swimming culture in different parts of the world, Iceland and Japan and Paris, as you'll see later, history of the bikini, women's bathing suits. This is a really a fun one for me. Um, I also researched some swimming greats from the past, people like Gertrude Ederly and Charlie Daniels, um, people who were pioneers in competitive swimming back in the day. The next phase for me was taking all of that research and all of the you know, gathering of names of people and I started interviewing my subjects and writing both the profiles and the infographics for the book. Carlin uh, Pipes was one of the great stories in the book. Um, she, her, she started swimming when she was a kid, um, showed enormous promise at a very young age, 
And long story short, um, uh, got involved in um, drugs and alcohol and became an addict by the time she was in her early 20s. Um, gave up full scholarships to um, some prestigious swimming opportunities. And basically, she, as she calls it, you know, her 20s to her 30s were, were her lost years. And then she got sober by going to rehab when she was, in, when she was 31. And within um, five days or something of getting out of rehab, she gets back in the pool. And within a few months, she starts setting world records, even after not swimming for 10 years. So this is a person who's exceptionally gifted. And instead of saying, oh, my time has passed, I screwed up, she got back in the water at 31. And in fact, in her mid-30s, she went back to college and swam on uh, the team at Cal State Bakersfield in California with women um, 12 to 15 years younger than, than her. And I think um, she calls that her, her do-over. Um, she got this chance, you know, it wasn't as prestigious a place as that she might have gone when she was 18, but she got to do her like collegiate competitive swimming and she had a ball and did really well. Um, I think she was like completely creaming some of the girls she was swimming against who were, who were um, half her age. And now she runs this amazing swimming school in Hawaii, so she's super inspirational. Shell was born with spina bifida, struggled her whole life, which is this really um, complex neuro neurological, skeletal, muscular disease that really affects the body and um, causes a lot of pain and discomfort. And um, she discovered swimming as part of her sort of uh, um, attempt to like feel good and re re rehabilitate after these various surgeries that she had. And um, she's, now, she's now 41 and she swims five miles a day. So if any of you are swimmers, you know that is a long way to swim every day. And she describes the water as a place where she feels more sort of graceful in life than she, than she does um, on land, and that's why she spends that much time swimming. Maya Khan was born with a, a chondroplasia dwarfism. Um, she is 14 now. She just had to take the last nine months off of swimming. She's a very accomplished um, Paralympic swimmer. Um, because she, as, when you're a dwarf you, and you're growing, your body doesn't always grow in the way that um, is comfortable or it should, and so surgeries are often required to help the body adjust to the growth. Um, and so she had to have one of these back surgeries, and she just got back in the water in the last few months and um, is really excited to be swimming again. She dreams of going to Tokyo in 2020 to swim in the Paralympic Games. This is Alexander. He has, uh, he, he's... 16 now, he has cerebral palsy, and he says the water is the only place he does not struggle. These are Caleb and Zion. They are the youngest people in my book. This is Paul. He is the oldest person in my book. He is 92 years old and swims almost every day. So, as I mentioned before, the bookmaking process for me isn't, isn't it's not like, oh, I do this, and then I research, and then I write, and then I illustrate. That's all happening sort of simultaneous. I'm working on different parts of the book, and I'm writing and illustrating, and then going back and writing and illustrating. And so in the book, we have a number of infographics. So um, pieces of, um, or illustrations that, that um, show or display various information that, that um, things like the history of the swimming pool, how fast can humans really swim, turns out not very fast, <laughs> or slower than sea otters. Um, um, pool culture in different countries, which was so fascinating. If you end up, if you have the book or end up buying the book, I encourage you to read the differences between Iceland, Paris, and Japan. It's really in incredible the rules. I wanted some of the illustrations to really evoke nostalgia. So um, some of them are just imagery that we can all relate to because we've all seen it. I also wanted the book to have a sense of humor. And let me tell you, 
I purposely said some dogs who are great swimmers. Because let me tell you, when I put this on Instagram, I was sharing images from the book before it was published. I put this on Instagram, and people were like, excuse me, my dog is a great swimmer, and he's not on there. Um, <laughs> people take these things very seriously. Or you, le you left off this breed or that breed. And so I was like, OK. Not dogs who are great swimmers, some dogs who are great swimmers. This is not a complete list. Um, so, backyard pool shapes. The anatomy of the swim parka, if you've ever been on a swim team, this will be familiar to you. I also wanted the book to have some um, some photography, so I collected a lot of vintage photos. Actually, none of them are at a pool. They're all beach and um, lake scenes. And I did a little fun coloring in Photoshop. And then, I really wanted to include some of my swimming collections. So I had, as I mentioned, published this book in 2011 called uh, Collection a Day. And um, it was all images of my collections, none of which in the book are swimming related. But I did actually, since then, acquire some swimming stuff. And um, they're all organized on an imaginary grid on a white background. And I was photographing them overhead. So here's some swimming medals in my collection. And some of the typography on these is really awesome. Um, ribbons, patches, and then vintage books about swimming little swimming magazines, these swimming times is from um, the UK, back in, from the 1920s, I believe. So all the ways I love to work in one book, hand lettering, painting, collecting, photographs. And so um, this was really a great opportunity for me to, to make a book about something that I'm really passionate about and, um, and use all of these different ways that I love to work as an artist. So one more bit of reality. I um, decided as part of making the book that I was going to hand letter every single profile. And there are over 30 in the book, or there's probably 37. So I spent like 19,000 hours hand lettering, editing the profiles so that I could fit them hand lettered on a page. And when the book was done, I even turned it in like this. And then the next day, I, literally after I turned in the book, I looked at the whole thing together. And I said, this is too much lettering. It's going to be too hard for people to access. I tried to envision people opening it up and trying to wade through my sometimes illegible um, printing. And so I made the decision to scrap that 19,000 hours of hand lettering and have the book, most of the book, typeset, which was a really hard decision. But again, I wanted the book to be the best book it could be, and so I had to let go of this investment of time I had made. And the fact that I thought this thing in the, rainbow, the rainbows and butterflies phase that I talked about earlier, the book, whole book was gonna be hand-lettered. In the end, it just didn't look how I wanted it to look, so we went this route, and I'm so much happier. Then you go to deliver the files, you use this thing called file transfer protocol, and then for about two days, you get to celebrate because it's not over. In my case, I make books that um, the publisher doesn't really look at for nine months. I do an early delivery of like a handful of things just to make sure I'm on the right track. Then I'm on my own. Then I turn the stuff in. And then a lot of the real work begins. The reality is that it takes six um, to nine months for the editing process after the book is submitted. So there's a lot of um, edits and revisions, copy editing, um, you know, uh, the art department saying, oh, this illustration needs a little work, or this isn't really working, or let's play with the layout. Oh yeah, and then there's the title and the cover. So what most people don't know is that the title and the cover come last. Um, I had a title in my head that I was very wedded to, and then um, the sales department at Chronicle said, no. Um, your title is boring, and no one will buy the book. And I had to get over being a little bit hurt, because um, we were, I was talking about this last night with the friends that I'm staying with here, that um, we, the, actually, who makes decisions about titles and covers is who? 
the sales department and why? They want the book to sell. So I'm, there was a lot of back and forth on the title. We ended up calling it The Joy of Swimming, a celebration of our love for getting in the water. We needed words like celebration and joy for obvious reasons. I love the title now, but at the time I was, um, you know, not, you know, we went through like a million iterations. There, you can also see here there's some other cover designs that we were messing around with. But eventually we came, with, came up with one. This is actually a PDF from my book designer explaining sort of um, what sa the sales team thought about this cover. And, and um, we even need to make sure that it looks good on Amazon. So this is actually a screenshot that my book designer at Chronicle sent me, um, which is like laid over another book. It's like she photoshopped that on there. You have to make sure that the book is, looks good at, as a thumbnail, right? Because that's how most people are going to buy it and it needs to stand out. So this is all stuff that you wouldn't necessarily think of, but it is the reality of making a book. And then eventually, over the course of months, off the book goes to print. And then the reality is you wait like another nine months or so to even get your advanced copy. Um, and sometimes it's so long that you forget that you even and then eventually a box shows up or a, like a FedEx package shows up and you have this beautiful, actual, tangible thing that you've been working on and only seen on a computer screen for the last year. Um, so I'm gonna do, I'm gonna wrap up here, but I'm gonna do one last little reading. And this is really about the connection for me between um, swimming and art making. There has always been a fixed and steady connection for me between art making and swimming. Both of these passions require similar things of me, enormous discipline and a unique form of endurance. They also provide motivation and direction in my life like no other pursuits. I learned that this connection is similar for many other artists and swimmers. When I began working on this book and sharing its progress on social media, scores of artists emailed me to let me know they were also swimmers. In her 2012 book, Swimming Studies, artist and writer Leanne Shapton talks, tells a beautiful and visceral tale of growing up a competitive swimmer and how, in part, that experience shaped her life as an artist. Reading Shapton's book was the first time I realized there was a connection between athletic and artistic discipline. Like art making, swimming is at the same time a rigorous exercise and also a form of play. It is also for many people a source of energy, vitality, and healing, a theme you will see repeated again and again throughout this book. Water wakes us up and holds us in time of distress or change. It allows the awkward to move with grace, the heavy to feel light, and the disabled to feel accomplished. It is an emotional blanket in times of recovery and vulnerability. It is a form of movement that supports us no matter how large or small we are, how tall or short, how able-bodied or disabled. And by the way, the, the profiles in this book really speak to that. In the words of swimming great Gertrude Ederly, when we're in the water, we're not in this world. May the book provide you with a glimpse into the capacity of swimming to transform, to heal, to empower, to strengthen, and to provide transcendent joy. Thank you.